ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event of the evening. It's time! This is Fessel Khan for Lights Out. And this is the all-new Lights Out MMA podcast, podcast four of the Lights Out MMA podcast, and proudly in association with Kimura Sports, the guys that sell the best combat sports equipment in the game today. Make sure you check out their page. We'll be sharing their links in the description. And joining the Combat Sports is the founder of Combat Sports, Javid. Javid, how's it going, my man? All good, man. What are you saying, man? You good? Very well, thank you for asking, man. Just um, really excited for this big card that we've got on the weekend. Um, before, obviously, we get started, just remind the viewers out there, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave your thoughts in the comment section, check us out on all the social media platforms, but also do not forget to check out Kimura Sports on their social media platforms. We'll be sharing their links in the description. As I mentioned before, a big, big card, UFC 259, Saturday night stroke, Sunday morning, Man, do you know what? I know we're only like three months into the year, yeah? Mm. But this card for me is going to take a lot to top. you got three world title fights in one yeah. night. You don't get any better than this. See, I don't know what the game plan is with USC. I think they realise like, you know, like boxing's not doing like as many events. Like there's not that many other sporting events. Why hold back? You might as well go full out whilst you've got the market kind of captivated in it. Like you might as well show... That go guns blazing and get everyone's attention as much as they can because I'm not sure if you've noticed like even like the video recordings and the like you know the embedded videos and stuff like that they've upped their like you know production value and their marketing strategy as well so it's actually pretty sick like, the, the way they're selling the last fight? who was it with the way they're selling this yeah. card has been brilliant the countdown to this card has been brilliant man mm. especially all over YouTube and Twitter yeah. Yeah, like I think that was probably one of the best uh, countdowns I've saw, which was the first um, countdown episode. And that was just focusing on um, Adesanya and, and Blackowitch and showing their camps. Like mm-hmm. it's always the same, but like, you know, it was showing like different elements, like, you know, that beach part where Adesanya was like climbing up the uh, beachy hill and stuff like that. It was all sick, man. No, definitely. And, like, seeing like, uh, what's his name's camp. So some of the content that they put up, I, I've, I've watched the um, the training where he's at the beach. And he's running up the hit up yeah. the up the hills up the sand, and you think, oh yeah. man, well, what's he going to gain out of that? Then you see him at the end of it; he looks proper knackered. But no, I must admit the yeah. the content that the UFC have been putting out the last couple of uh, weeks, the lead the build up to this to this uh, card yeah. has been brilliant. Well, have you when is have you ever seen a card like this before? Like, if you had to compare this card to any other, do you think it's possible, or do you think this is probably the best card UFC have put on? I think back in day, quite a while ago, they did used to like go all out as well and put like, you know, a stacked card, like, you know, there'll be like quite a few championship fights as well. One card that brings, like, I can think back, it's quite a while ago, is UFC 100, when we had like GSP on that card, uh, Brock Lesnar on that card. You had um, quite a few other like, you know, fights as well on that card. It's happened a few times, but it's really rare. Like, you, it normally happens for like a UFC 100 away. Like, you know, a big kind of like, uh, card like a UC 100 a UC 200 maybe that's when they kind of go full out but for something like you know just like a UFC 259 with nothing like to celebrate over or anything like that but yeah it's quite it's, no it's quite different man well it Especially takes- it's not like an end of the year card as well or anything like that it's just in the middle of like, you know the year kind of thing or start mm. of the year and they're going full out as I, as I mentioned, obviously, we're only three months into the year, but this card is is something to really get excited for. The countdown, as we both said, has been brilliant. Um, let's talk a bit about the weighing results, obviously, before we yeah. you know, sort of jump into the, the deep end of the podcast. Um, Israel Adesanya weighed almost five pounds less than Jan Biachowicz. Um, Biachowicz coming at 205, Adesanya at 200 and a half pounds. Um, and then obviously, if you look at uh, in the women's section, you know, Amanda Nunez, she come in at 145 and then um, Megan Anderson come in half a pound lighter. So pretty much on the same scales there. Yeah. And then obviously Peter Yan, uh, 135. He obviously defends that bantamweight title against Al Jermaine, Funkmaster Sterling and uh, Sterling come in at 134 and a half pounds. Now, we're going to talk all about about all three fights, but obviously you have to talk about the main event. You know, you got to talk yeah. about Biakovic defending that title against Israel Adesanya. Now, Israel is, I said it when we did our first podcast, yeah, is the yeah, guy yeah. that to look out for. I believe he's the next big thing. I believe he's on the verge of greatness, and I believe a win on Saturday night 
probably puts him close enough to that Hall of Fame bracket. But yeah, look, yeah. there's no secret in admitting it. you got better knowledge of me in this sport, right? If we talk boxing, yeah. I'd say I've got better knowledge, vice versa. Yeah. Does the weight issue concern you for Israel Adesanya on Saturday night? It does a bit, you know. Like, it just shows, like, you know, is this camp going all right? Like, you know, is his diet and stuff on point? Because, like, you know, making weight, you want to be on point in it. You want to be that, hitting that 205. Like, you want every advantage that you can. Now, it's not a big issue, you know, when you, like, go up to, like, say, like, you know, like heavyweight or heavyweight like that, if you're, like, two, three pounds lighter. But then considering, like, you know, this is Israel on his first time in, like, heavyweight and he's, like, you know, not able to hit it, it does leave a few question marks and stuff. But I personally don't look, I wouldn't look too much into it. I don't think it will have like a huge effect because like what's helping Adesanya in this fight or like, you know, what's the main thing going into this fight for him is it's going to be his skills. Now, whether he's got a four, three, four extra pounds on him going into this fight, I don't think it'll make a difference. To be honest, he could be going to this fight on purpose, like going a bit lighter so that he has that speed and he still has that reflexes because he even said it himself, like, you know, he does the best of chins, but he makes it up with his, like, defense and his, like, timing and his skills and so forth. So maybe he is doing it on purpose, so then he still has that speed edge on um, um, Pakovic. But, again, like, I I'll, I'll probably wouldn't read too much into it. I still think, like, you know, he's going to go out there and put on a great performance. You know, before, obviously, I asked you that question, I mentioned it's a chance for him to cement his legacy and he could become the fifth fighter in UFC history to hold two belts at the same time. And one thing I love about Adesanya is he's not really taking his eyes off the middleweight division. He said uh, in an interview yeah. during the week, he said, if, even if I win on Saturday night and I do become light heavyweight champion, I'm still going to focus on the middleweight champion. You know, obviously, Amanda Nunez has done it now for quite a few years where she's fought at one weight then fought at another. But do you not think, like, with him sort of if he does become, you know, a world champion, a two-weight world champion, that sort of like, I don't know, adds more pressure to, to his game. Because, I mean, I look at it and I just think, right, that UFC obviously a lot different to boxing and would it not make more sense for him to concentrate on just one weight? Like, what as a, as a fan that studied the sport, that knows a lot about sport, what do you think is the right thing for him to do if he is victorious on Saturday night? Let's be honest, the difference between middleweight and light heavyweight is not a small one. It's 20 pounds. It's 185 versus 205. That, that is not an easy jump. Like, you look at Adesanya, he's like, what, 6'2 or ish? He's quite tall. I think he's just as tall as um, Bakowicz as well. So, like, he probably does have the build. He probably does maybe walk around, like, you know, 190, even 200 pounds possibly. So, but even that, like, I think it is quite a big jump, a big, like, weight to be, like, you know, going up and down in. I personally think, like, considering what weight he is and he is that uh, as well, I think maybe, you know, two or five fight one time, maybe two times, but then he's definitely going to need to stick to one weight. Because I reckon, like, for him to, like, you know, drop back down again for middleweight or to even, like, you know, go back up to stay at middleweight, I mean, um, like, heavyweight as well, it will take him time. It's not an easy switch doing the 20 pounds as well. So... <laughs> Yeah, I guess like I would like to see him like stick out one weight, but I, I mean, can't see I, him switching often. I personally don't think he will stay out one weight. I mean, because obviously he was talking about um, obviously the next step if he does get past Bjakovic on Saturday night. He's talked about fighting Darren Till next. You know, there's a lot of people really yeah. hyping the John Jones fight, and um, I think I mean. I don't know personally, you know, because I've not studied yeah. him as much as I would have liked to, but. I know that he is a great fighter and that he's got yeah. he's got an arrogance that pays off. You know, he's very, very confident in himself. I mean, I seen him yeah. last Saturday in um, for the all New Zealand boxing fight between Joseph Parker and Junior Far. And he's just mm. he's just a proper cool, calm person and he believes in himself a lot, which is what I really like about him. But he's already in the back of his mind thinking, get past Bakovic on Saturday night, he wants to fight Darren Till next. And he's openly said that he's willing to take the fight with John Jones. But one thing that you know, would worry me about, you know, after this fight is, you know, he's not sure whether he's going to be a full-time middleweight, a full-time light heavyweight. And as you mentioned, there's a massive difference between light heavyweight and middleweight. Yeah. And I think any fighter trying to kill himself to make weight really messes him up. And it's like, after camp, you know, it's just like, come the night of the fight, you see someone totally different. And I'm hoping it's not the case, but it wouldn't surprise me if that, the moving up your weight does play its toll on him on Saturday night. Yeah. To be honest, it, it'll be quite good to see as well. And let's not forget, like, you know, Blackowitch is, is actually a solid fighter. It's a 
totally different ball game. Like, you know, when um, Israel Adesanya was in his kickboxing days as well, he did fought, fire, like, you know, heavier weights as well. I think he did fire, like, you know, the light heavyweight version of that, the kickboxing as well. So he probably is used to, like, you know, that hard hitting fires as well. But then again, we're talking about like 14 ounce gloves then in kickboxing. This is now five ounce gloves in uh, MMA. So like, it, there is like question marks of whether he'll be able to like, you know, sustain like fighting at 205 and whether he can like, you know, handle that. So that is a, a big question mark there as well. And to be honest, I actually kind of don't know why he would take this fight. I don't, I don't understand like, you know, why he would go up to like heavyweight, man. It's a, it's crazy if you think about it, like, not a lot of light heavyweights have actually moved up to, um, um, I mean, uh, not a lot of middleweights have moved up to light heavyweight. It's actually quite rare. I think maybe like Anderson Silva did it. He mm -hmm. did it for like, you know, one, two, three fights. It wasn't the best. It didn't go the best for him. But still, like, you know, it's it's a big it's a big jump. So now I prefer to see him stick out uh, middleweight because it is a stacked division middleweight as well because you've got, um, what's his name? You've got Darren Till there as well. And you also got um, Robert Ruitka as well, who just mm -hmm. recently beat um, Daniel Cognier, I think his name is. So he's got like you know quite a few good fighters there, but do you want to know why he wants to move up to light heavyweight? Right, if you look at Israel Adesanya, yeah, okay, he's had seventy-five professional kickboxing fights and he's had six boxing fights. Yeah, the, the guy lives and breathes combat yeah. sports. The guy yeah. is that hungry to be to cement his legacy. And I've seen he's legit in martial artist. Yes, and I've seen interviews of him in the past, and he, he's even said. Till this day, like, he's never going to write off fighting prof in professional boxing again. That he'll always yeah. be willing to go back into kickboxing. The, the guy lives and breathes the sport. But when you look at serious challenges, a lot of people, I mean, I remember the build-up to the Paolo Costa fight. A lot of people said, oh, Paolo Costa's style, his arrogance, you know, his mind games that he plays in the octagon is going to beat him. And I was watching that fight and I was thinking, wait, hold on a second. You got Paolo Costa on one side, is like, come and hit me, come and hit me. And Israel yeah. Adesanya was making it look so easy. So I think you, yeah. you got, for me... He's kind of like, the, the, I think for me, he's the next heir to the throne in the sport. You know how like right now you've got Con Khabib, Conor McGregor, these fighters would like, would like to think yeah. like they're the poster boys of the sport. I do look at Adesanya and I think, win on Saturday night, defend that belt a couple of times, cement your legacy, I think he'll become the face of this sport. But again, you can't rule out Biakovic because he, obviously he's an elder fighter, he's a more experienced fighter. And of course, he's fought at this weight most of his career. So does that not make Biakovic... The favourite going into Saturday night? 100%. If I was a gambling man, like, I'll put my money on Blackowitz. It's like the it's the right thing to do. But it's a hard one, man, because he hits so hard, man. It's like totally different power and stuff. But then you got to see, like, you know, Adesanya's, like, skill as well. Like, what does power mean if you can't, like, you know, reach him and stuff, if you can't, like, touch him? So, like, is he still going to be able to, like, you know, keep that distance? But saying that, there were fights where, like, you know, Adesanya was getting touched up like, against uh, Kevin Gastelum and stuff. He, he was getting, like, you know, touched all the time there. He was getting overhand right and, like, you know, he was getting up a head kick, everything. But then going to this Black Witch fight, maybe he will be a bit more smarter, like, fighting him, realising, like, you know, he's got that <laughs> Polish power <laughs> <still> behind him. <laughs> you know, one interesting fact about this fight is um, Jakovic, for me, when they talk about what style, what game plan Adesanya is going to bring to this fight is, is that um, nine times out of ten, he's probably going to rely more, more on his boxing. Now, what Biakovic's team has done is they brought in Izu Ugano, who's yeah, a yeah, professional yeah. boxer and a kickboxing champion. Izu Ugano, Ugano's fought some, some half-decent fighters up at heavyweight. I believe he fought Dominic Brazil. So, sort of looking mm. at that makes me think that their tactics are going to be to avoid... Adesanya's um, boxing stance and probably, I don't know, probably look to maybe box him a bit more as well because I do think, looking at it, I do think Adesanya's got more chance of beating him with his boxing than anything else other than grappling or any sort of takedown, yeah. anything like that. I don't, I can't see, especially with the weight difference, I can't see Adesanya taking him down. I think Adesanya's best, no. best chances are, are to, to move, use the octagon, to use his boxing skills and to sort of like tie Biakovic out. But again, if Biakovic does catch him, if he is able to sort of grapple him, it could be game over. And as you mentioned, that's where the weight class sort of makes a difference. Yeah. Do you reckon he's going to be going for the calf kicks again and trying to take out, like, you know, Blackowitz's uh, lead leg as well, like, 
as he did against Paulo Costa. That seemed quite effective. And like, I don't know, calf kick seems to be like the new, not the new thing, but like seems to be quite popular now in MMA. Well, it, it paid off for Dustin Poirier, didn't it, against Conor McGregor? Exactly. But do you know what, again, again, like I said, when you're kicking someone down at middleweight with calf kicks is one thing, but when you're doing it up at um, light heavyweight, it's a, it's, it's, it's a whole lot different. And I do think Adesanya's best chances of winning this fight on Saturday night will come down strictly to his boxing. And I think the longer the fight goes on, the more it probably favours Adesanya, even though Biakovic has had more fights where I believe he's won more on decision, more of his fights, have, more of his mm. wins have come by decision. Um, Adesanya has won five fights by decision, where Biakovic has won 10 fights by decision. So... Again, I would like to I would like to think if I'm a betting man and if Adesanya is going to win this fight on Saturday night, it will be down to his boxing and it will be down to the fact that he's stopped more of his opponents. But again, I'm looking at the fact that Djokovic has brought in Izzy Ugano. I mean, is this... You can look at it two ways. One, are they going to learn how to avoid these punches? Or two, are they going to look to bring their boxing more into effect in this fight? Hmm. No, that's a good question. Because the thing is, Israel does live his chill out there. Because he mm-hmm. has that whole hands-down approach and everything like that. You know, he's more of a counter-fighter. So I think that might be the right approach for Blackowicz. Like, you know, try and take him out like the boxing and stuff. Like, try to just land, like, you know, one haymaker. A lot will be... You'll be able to see how the fight plays out from the first round. Like, if Blackowicz is able to, like, you know, get in close and, like, you know, land his punches and stuff and actually touch Israel Adesanya, I think then from there, it's kind of game over. I think, like, you know, that's it. It's like Black Witch's game as well. But well, it's a, a lot will be told from the first round. Well, when you're gonna when you're getting hit down at middleweight is one thing, but when you're getting hit, hit up at light, mid, exactly. at light heavyweight, you know, the, the punches will be more more effective yeah. and obviously they'll have more of a more of a big blow. But I, I don't... It's tough because we've not seen Adesanya move up at to light heavyweight, but we've seen Adesanya adapt his game in kickboxing, in boxing, yeah. and every time people have thought, "Oh, yeah, he's, he's gonna he's gonna lose. This test is gonna be too big for him." He's come through that test. I mean, you know, he absolutely tormented Paolo Costa. He walked through Yal Yal Romero, and then obviously yeah. remember what he did to Robert Whitaker as well. So I think exactly. the bet I think the better the test for Adesanya, the more he shines. And I think he's one of those yeah. fighters that you tell him something that's gonna be very tough to come through. You'll be like, okay, yeah. I'll show you the octagon what I'm capable of. So I don't exactly. think mind games and stuff like that phases this guy and I don't think the the higher the test, the higher the, high, the, higher the show is going to phase him. But one thing, again, I'm going to move move on to is is the fact that what sort of approach does Biakovic bring into this and what does this, you know, bringing Izu Agano into, this, into the team, you know, what does that sort yeah. of entitle? I mean, is he going to focus more on his boxing or is he going to look to stop um, Adesanya's boxing but let's talk the actual fight prediction itself I uh, listen I'd be a bit of a yo-yo if I went back on what I said in our first podcast that I said Adesanya is the next yeah. big thing I think Adesanya is going to beat him on points oh okay I'm going no, for Adesanya it's a tough one it's, it's actually a really tough one there's just too many things playing into this one I, I can't even like, you know, make my mind up like one time I'm thinking like yeah Adesanya on points the next thing I'm thinking is that one round one TKO by um, Blackowicz man it's just, that, that can't happen it's, that can't happen on Saturday night can't happen to Adesanya you never know but it can't man. happen you never know man that Polish power man <laughs> well listen have you you know we're talking about some of the content did you see yeah. one of, when he went into I believe it was that river and he just sat in that oh, cold lake. lake. Yeah, you know, man, man. My man didn't even shake or anything. He was <laughs> like, yeah, like in a hot tub. <laughs> it's, it's like, he was like, he was sat in there and he was enjoying it. And I was thinking, my gosh, yeah, I wouldn't yeah, be man. able to put my right leg in there, let alone my whole body. But that's... Exactly. But, but that's the mindset of a, a champion. And that's what I like about yeah. him. And he's a real, he's a real professional, is uh, Biakovic. And yeah. obviously, you, you, you watch some of his interviews. He said, like, since he's won the world title... He's had a son and his life has changed. Exactly. Yeah. You know, he's received more publicity in Poland. You know, he had a day where he He's a humble out. man. He's very humble. And do you know what I like about this fight is, is that there's not been any like sort of heat between these two. Yeah, yeah I think exactly. one or two words were exchanged at the at the face off, but that's just yeah. you know, that's just the fight talk stuff. You. <laughs> you leave the next man's face, of course you're gonna see some shit, man. Like exactly it's intense though, man. You're looking down in your bloody fighters, put your opponent's eyes and stuff, like you're gonna be fighting this guy, so it's expected, man. Exactly, but, man. As fight fans, you want to see that. But I do think there's been yeah. like a lot of humbleness between these two. But again, yeah. I said Adesanya will win on Saturday night. I'm still waiting for your prediction. 
See, as a kickboxing fan, as a Muay Thai like fan as well, I have to go with Adesanya. But like, I'm always saying percentage wise, 60 40 for me. Actually, mm. yeah, 55 45 then. 55 percent, I'll say Adesanya by points, and 45 uh, knockout by uh, Blackowitch by like mm. say round three, round four. It's going to be a big fight. And do you know what? This is a type of fight where you wish it was under, under the fans, but is what it is. Yeah. Let's move on. Let's talk about the women's uh, side of things. Um, Amanda Nunez defends her women's featherweight title against Megan Anderson. Um, you know Amanda- she's six foot. Mate, when oh. she stood up in the, when she stood up yeah, in the press man. conference, I was like, well, where are you, man? Like, yeah. The ladders look at like, like, you. What are you doing? Man, like, what the hell? Like, help a Bengali brother out here, man. Like, <laughs> out here, like, 5'10", five, 5'9". Five, she stood up next to Israel Adesanya in the press conference and I was like, oh my gosh, like you're up there. Like he's all the way down there. Exactly. So make the guy look like a midget. She is huge. She's very tall. She's got a big reach. You know, that's yeah. one thing you could say that could work into her advantage. But when you talk about MMA, bro, I don't care what you say, man. You could say Ronda Rousey this, you could say whoever. For me, the lioness Amanda Nunez, greatest women fighter of all yeah. time. She's a beast. She's an animal. She, she actually embodies love fight she actually like you know always in it for the scrap man like and you know what like she's a bit wild but she's technical at the same time it's kind of hard to explain like her shots the way she throws them and like the the follow-ups and everything it's like quite crisp and it's just she's just got like a lot of raw power behind them she's a hardcore trainer man and she's like you know she's always been training with like you know top athletes as well all the time so even like from her camp like she's always got like top athletes she's sparring against and, like, she's got a really good coach behind her as well. So, yeah, man, she, it's going to be a hell of a fight, man. It's going to be a big test. It's going to be a big test because, like, um, what's her name? Megan, she she has something, like, you know, Amanda Nunes has a forward. Like, someone who's, like, you know, got the pull, who's got a good jab on them as well. And, like, you know, who's got, like, just that bulkiness behind them. So, it's going to be hard for Amanda Nunes to, like, you know, connect. But Amanda Nunes, even at this weight, she has a lot of power. She still has a lot of power. So I wouldn't be surprised if she gets a knockout as well. She's Amanda Nunes, she's also the first and only fighter in UFC history to defend both titles whilst actively holding them. Current bantamweight champion, current featherweight women's champion. Um, she's on a good streak right now, won her last 11 fights in a row. She, I mean, she is a, she's a beast, brother, as you said, man. I mean, you look at her and you think, mm, okay, she don't look all that, but looks can be deceiving in this let me, sport. Let me ask you a random question. Go Who do you think would win in a fight, Amanda Nunes or Floyd Mayweather in a street fight? Bro, come on, man. You can't ask me that question, bro. No, I don't... Well, it's a woman fighting a man, isn't it? And if the, if Mayweather respected women, he'd be like, no, I don't want to fight you. You're a woman. I don't... No, but like I know, a street it's... fight. Like, it's just a random street fight that just happens. Let's ignore, I'd... like, political correctness and everything like that. Bro, no I've always... Bar, I've no always... weapons... <laughs> I've always said you can't touch Floyd's defense, man. No matter who you are, man. It's um, oh, bro. I don't know, nah, man. I just think Floyd would jab him. Bro, you put one of UFC's best in the ring with Floyd, and look what happened, man. It was it was a mismatch. Yeah. I mean, I'm, okay, you're saying this. Is, you're saying a street fight. Anything can happen in a street fight. No rules in the street Grappling, fight. Grappling kicks. Oh, I don't know, bro. I know. Listen, I can never put my money on against. But let's look, look. Stay on topic here, man. You're asking me questions <laughs> that are literally impossible to answer. I tell you what, we'll do right tomorrow. I'll go on that Instagram page and I'll put a poll up about it, yeah? You'll get my answer from oh, the poll, yeah? I'll, sure. I'll put up. But let's talk a bit about Amanda Nunez. Um, 32 years old, as we mentioned, she's achieved so much in, in the sport, beat the likes of Ronda Rousey, two wins over Valentina Shevchenko, you know, longest reigning current UFC champion, longest winning streak in women's UFC, mm. and third defence of a featherweight title. Does a win on Saturday night, is that enough for her to sort of leave the sport behind and retire? I don't think she will. I think she's think in she for even more. I think nah, she won't. She she's gonna keep on going, man. I don't, she's a type who will stop once, like you know, there's nothing at, at all left for her. Like as you said, she has accomplished a lot. But even then, I think she would just continue. She would just continue defending her because like she genuinely loves to fight, man. She loves to scrap, and I think that's what she always will want to do. Like she'll be waiting for like you know new defenders and like new title fights and everything like that I think she was just continue dominating like she won't get bored of it she even said like you know when she was like watching Ronda Rousey and stuff like that she would like look up to her and stuff and then she used to think like you know one day it will be me who where people fight like look up to me and that's the time that I can't wait for when people who look up to me come to me for fight 
So I think that's what she's waiting for as well. It's like we're waiting for that new generation of like, you know, women fighters as well. But she's looking to like defend that stuff for ages, man. I personally don't think she will. And I hope she does it, man. No, but you're right. You know, you you would hope that she does continue. But then again, you have to look at it. You know, as I mentioned, she's achieved so much. You know, she's got mm-hmm. big wins under her belt. As you mentioned, she looked up to Ronda Rousey and she blew up the scene. She turned up. She blew Ronda Rousey away. You know, she's got all these wins under her belt. You know, she's achieved so much in the sport. But then you have to like sort of ask the question, you know, what keeps her hungry? That's why you rate a fighter like Amanda Nunez. She just keeps yeah. going. She'll go up to featherweight and defend her belt. Then she move back down back and she'll defend her belt. And she's taking on, you know, the, the 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 longer she goes on in her career, she's taking on tougher and tougher tests. And as you mentioned, Megan Anderson, man, the woman is hella high. You know, she oh, fucking I, I literally nearly pulled a muscle in my neck just looking up at that <laughs> high at her because she is huge. But Listen, they Have say that fist size. My mate, I've seen her fist size. I've seen how good she hits. You know, she's a former Invicta FC featherweight champion as well. Yeah. Uh, do you think people are sort of overlooking her going into this fight, and they look at how destructive and dominant Nunez has been, and they're not really giving uh, Megan Anderson the chance? Yeah, to an extent, I think the way uh, Megan Anderson has been kind of marketed as well, it's not been in a way to like you know promote her as like a fire or her skill set and stuff like that i feel like you know her perception that's done by kind of like usc is a, a bit different i feel like she's more of a like a kind of poster girl like you know but there is a lot of and i can't blame them for doing that as well and i can't blame some of the fans for like overlooking her because of that but yeah she she's real the real deal as well man she's got a good skill set on her good hands so yeah man people are overlooking her a bit so it'll be a good scrap Nine KOs in her last nine fights. Does she look to KO Amanda Nunez on Saturday night? Oh, what yeah. a statement that would be. What, will, what a statement that would be if she knocks out Amanda yeah. Nunez on Saturday night. Yeah, definitely. No, no it is, I am she's going to be headhunting. She's going to be headhunting. But do you think she's got a chance of knocking out Amanda Nunez on Saturday night, though? Yeah, because, like, as... Good as Amanda Nunes is, as I said, man, she loves to get into those scraps where she's like not defended and she's just trading blows, like you know, left, right, left, right, left, right. So there's always a chance, man. No matter how good you are, you can get caught. Like you know, it's always that punches that you don't see that come and like you know knock you out or something like that. And especially with like you know Megan's reach as well. So like, if she's like trading blows and stuff, how many of her punches are going to land and how many of Megan's are going to land as well? So. If she goes into those exchanges that she did before against say, someone like Cyborg or you know other like female fighters as well, then that yeah, I believe there is a chance. You know, when, when we talk about obviously the the bigger the test, sometimes it could be a bit too much for people. Now we look at big occasions yeah. that Megan Anderson's been in, and obviously she went up against Holly Holm, and mm-hmm. you know in 2018, and she lost. Yeah. You know, a lot of people said that night. You know, obviously um, just doing a bit of research and looking back at some of her previous fights. A lot of people said that the occasion was too big for her. Now, you look at that in two ways. One, does that experience, is that going to help second time round? Or two, yeah. is that playing in the back of her mind that the last time she stepped up was against Holly Holm? But this time, she's not just stepping up against anyone. She's stepping up against, you know, the, the female king of, you know, women's MMA. And I just, I personally feel that maybe the fight has not come at the right time for her. I'm not, not like discrediting her or anything. Yeah. I just think right now there's nobody out there that's capable of stopping um, Amanda Nunez. Yeah. No, that's actually quite a good point, man. Like, to be honest, she has improved since the Holly Holm fight. Like, you know, you see it as well, but you just said it as well. Amanda Nunez is a whole different type of beast. Like, for example, if we were to replay the Holly Holm versus Megan Anderson fight, I think it would be a different story. But this is not Holly Holm. This is Amanda Nunez. Like, you know, she, she... probably can, like, you know, break down, uh, what's her name, Megan Anderson's reach, and she can probably get close as well. She's got a whole different skill set that Megan Anderson hasn't seen before. So, yeah, you're right, man. It is a, it is a big test. But, again, we just don't know. She might come out to play, man. She might be able to, like, you know, keep her at bay or, like, you know, keep her game plan. Because as soon as she lets Amanda Nunes get close, then, like, you know, it's kind of game over. So if I was Me- uh, Megan, I'll be, like, you know, doing those, like, side kicks to the knees, Keeps everything, thrown loads of ki- head kicks as well. Because the thing that um, uh, what uh, her name just slipped out of my head. Amanda Nunes does is like 
she just comes straight in with her punches as well. So what uh, Megan Anderson needs to do is just like, you know, keep that jab going, keep the left cheek going, like, you know, keep her at bay and pick the shots as well. Kind of like, you know, stay on the outside. How you would normally fight against a short opponent. She needs to do that. Well, watching so, the watching the press conference, uh, Megan Anderson said that she feels she's the first true featherweight that brings Amanda Nunez a lot of power. So I kind of think that her intentions are pretty clear on Saturday night, especially when she's that high and she's got that reach advantage on her. But again, look, listen, you know, this this sport, I mean, you know, it's pretty clear who the all-time greats are. And you look at Amanda Nunez, right? She's just had a kid, but she trains yeah. even hard now. She doesn't let her eye go yeah. off the ball. She's so dedicated to this sport, it's unreal. And I just do think that right about now, it's going to take a lot to stop Amanda Nunez. But as you did say, the height plays a massive advantage in it. What game plan do you take in to that fight on Saturday night? You know, you're Amanda Nunez, you're considered one of the greatest female fighters of all time, but then you're fighting a fighter like Megan Anderson, who comes with a lot of experience, former Invicta FC featherweight champion, and who's got a massive height advantage over her. She's been knocking people out left, right and centre. She's on a massive roll right now. How do you approach that? You're just going to have to take some just to get in close. There is no other way about it. That She can't set. It's not like, you know, Mike Tyson, when he was able to, like, you know, he's a short opponent. And, like, when he's fighting against tall opponents, he was able to, like, you know, lunge in with his jab and, like, getting close like that. In this, like, you know, the reach is just too much. So she will take a few punches getting in close. And she just needs to accept that. But as soon as she gets in close, that's when it's her, like, you know, opportunity to, like, you know, get those body shots in, get those, like, you know, hooks in as well. Because, like, as a tall opponent, Megan Anderson will find it harder to hit someone who's inside of their chest. So that's exactly what Amanda Nunes needs to do is accept I'm going to get jabbed, accept I'm going to get teeped and stuff, coming in, accept it and just, like, come forward and just, like, bring the fight to her. Always, like, pressure her as well. Cut off the cage, cut off any room that she can, dominate the centre of the ring as well whenever she can. And if she can get uh, Megan Anderson against the cage, that's when she will be... Um, winning that's when she'll be like you know implementing her game plan is to pressure uh, Megan Anderson against the cage as much as she can and land those shots get Megan Anderson to like cover up and gain as close as she can do you know what Javid I love the fact that you just mentioned Mike Tyson because if you do think if you do look at it right yeah. in terms of how they approach fights it's kind of like a, it is like she's got like a Mike Tyson approach and I remember Evander Holyfield after he beat Tyson in the first fight they said man how did you manage to do that you know Tyson eats the taller opponents alive and she goes look I no he said how dare I call Evander Holyfield a woman Evander Holyfield <laughs> Evander Holyfield said listen I just did what every other fighter should have done I didn't allow him to bully me I kept him at my distance you know, I beat him yeah. with a simple jab and, you know, he wasn't the bully. I was the bully. So interesting fight on Saturday night. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to seeing yeah. how Megan Anderson, how much she's come on since that defeat to Holly Holm. But let's get a prediction. And still, for me, I think Amanda Nunez, I think yeah. Amanda Nunez beats her. I think she stops her as well. I think it's, I think she's going to stop her. I can just see it happening. Same. Same. I, I would agree as well. I see like a fourth round stoppage, in my opinion. Well, me and you can eat a lot of humble pie if it's the other way around and if Megan Anderson does manage to stop her. But listen, you never know, man. It's one of those fights. They say the greats are there to be taken out and then for another great to come up. But I still think there's plenty of life left in the old dog. Um, talk about the third world title fight on that card for the Bantamweight Championship. Pielta Yan, I think that's how the Russians pronounce it. I'm just going to call him Peter Yan. No, Peter No Mercy Yan defends his title against... Aljamain Funk Master Sterling. Now, this one is where the fire's at. This, for me, is going to be fire yeah. tonight because Aljamain Sterling was trying to, like, you know, spice up the press conference. You know, you could see him having a little bit of a little bit of a dig at him, you know. Yeah. And then, um, obviously, just a little while ago, watching the weigh-in, you know, Sterling was like, I'm going to drown you. You've never fought anyone like me. So, I think this, for me, is where the heat really is. This is where, you know, you could tell that there's, these two generally want to knock each other the fuck out. And I do look at yeah. Aljamain Sterling. He is really confident going into this fight. But again, you know, Peter Yan's no joke, man. It's a tough fight for exactly. Sterling on Saturday night, don't you think? Oh, yeah, it's going to be a very tough fight because, like, the thing for Peter Yan is, like, you look at his previous fights here. 
against Max Holloway. Yes, you can say he lost against Max Holloway and like, you know, maybe even, like, you know, lost one, draw one or whatever it is. But he put on like, you know, a really good performance and he showed like, you know, he can like fight against those like, high caliber fighters and like, you know, retain his title and stuff. He's a very skilled fighter and like, you know, his output is like, he has a huge output as well in all of his fights. I think he has like one of the highest outputs as well. So this is why I like this weight division, man. It's just such an interesting division just because like, all the fighters are out there to like, you know, knock their opponents out and they always just have higher outputs. But yeah, it will be a, a tough fight for Aljamain Sterling. Uh, looking at his record as well, like he hasn't had that many fights against top opponents though. To be honest, he hasn't fought like you know the best of the best or like you know the greatest. I'll say this is probably his biggest test, so it will be quite an important fight for Aljamain Sterling. A just to get his name out there and like you know show like everyone what he's about. But B like you know if he wins this title, like if he beats him, then he'll be up there, man. He'll be fighting the best, so he'll have. A, I think if he beats um, Peter Yan, that's only like the step. He has a huge, like, you know, backlog of, like, you know, really skilled fighters, such as, like, Max Holloway, who will be hunting him down as well. So it's actually quite a really interesting fight, man. Like, either way you look at it, whether Peter Yang wins or whether Aljamain Sterling wins, there's a, there's a lot that will happen to that weight division, whichever, whichever fighter wins. You, you, you obviously said that he hasn't got many notable wins on his career, and, you know, you're 100% right, but yeah. he's got a lot of achievements. Um, black belt in jiu-jitsu. Um, ranked number one fighter in the UFC bantamweight division right now and considered one of the best when it comes to submissions as well and obviously a former Cage Fury fighting championship but obviously this is you know, these are the big leagues you know this is the big time fighting on uh, mm. a, a, a massive card like this UFC 259 and I've always listen I've always believed that no matter whether it's boxing whether it's MMA whatever sort of combat sports is I've always believed that experience probably gets you over the finishing line and if you look at it when you talk about experience yes Peter Yan or Pieter Yan, whatever, however you pronounce it, he is the defending champion. It's his first title defence. He, but he's 28 years old and he's had six fights less than Aljamain Funkmaster Sterling. I just want to move away from the actual fight itself. You mentioned something about management earlier on in the podcast. Do you think um, Aljamain Funkmaster Sterling, 31 years of age, 22nd, 23rd fight, do you think he's been managed right? Do you think that this shot at the title should have come a lot sooner? That's actually a, quite a good point. I've actually never thought about it like that, to be honest. If I, in all honesty, I've actually never thought about it. But now that you mentioned it, that is that is actually totally true. But I think that is kind of like you know, kind of a theme that you see in UFC. There's a few fighters who who just get put on the backlog, who just like you know get kind of shelved and don't get that title fight that they all like you know really deserve. A prominent fighter that everyone knows who should have had a title fight or should be a champion by now is Tony Ferguson. Like, you know, his title fights and like, you know, or like, you know, his scheduled title fights have always been like postponed or like, you know, he's just always been fighting the top caliber fighters, but he never got that title fight shot. So sometimes it is like, you know, it, you can blame it on the management, you can also blame it on the coach or like, you know, whoever, but there's also a part to blame on like, you know, UFC because like, I think what the UFC sometimes do is that, you know, they do look at popularity as well as a big reason to, like, you know, put a fire against, like, you know, the best as well. It does play a bit of a role into it. But, yeah, I think there is a few things at play as well. But who, who knows? Maybe, like, you know, he just... Did, that's the thing as well. He just didn't beat none of those, like, you know, really notable fighters to get his name up there on the mm -hmm. rankings. So I think it is possibly, like, you know, a cause of, like, multiple things, to be honest, with this one. It would be hard to, like, you know, just say one thing, but totally possible that like, management as well played a part in this. Yeah, because I was just looking at, I was obviously looking at what he's, you know, some of the achievements outside of the MMA and, you know, what he brings to the table. And I was just thinking, like, a 31 years old, you know, first world title shot, I mean, is, you know, is, am, I, am I missing something here? But again, at the same time, like, he's given the opportunity you now. He's, he's really confident. Um, said in the press conference that um, Jan's grappling is not on the same level as him. And um, he also said that he's going to, that uh, Jan also said that he's going to knock out uh, Aljamain Sterling because he doesn't rate his defense or anything. So, as I said, you know, there's animosity there, there's heat there, there's fire in the belly there. These two genuinely, I wouldn't say dislike each other, but they, you, you know, out of all three world title fights, he was looking for one of them to sort of light a spark at the press conference. And fair enough, the other two didn't, but this one had a bit of spark there. Going into the fight, I mentioned um, experience. You look at Yan's victories in the past, you know, beat Faber, you know, beat the 
the, I like to call him the great Jose Aldo. Does that sort of experience in those caliber of fights give him the upper hand in this fight with Sterling? Oh yeah, one hundred percent, definitely. He's been in like you know quite a lot of wars. He's like you know he's full. He, when you fight the best, you kind of like you know up in level. Like you know you just like you know you just bring a whole different level to it as well. Like and that affects you throughout your whole training. It affects your mentality as well. So you just do upgrade as a fighter as well, and it just brings you to a different level. So so yeah, it's like it plays a huge part into it. When you fight the best against, I mean, the best out of the best for a while, it just it just helps you to become a much better fighter. So yeah, it, it plays a huge part into this. But another thing that's important is like I feel like both fighters come into this fight have something to prove. Like especially like Peter Yan as well, he has like something to definitely prove as well because of like you know his previous fights as well. There's a few question marks behind them. Um, amazing as well. He's getting his first like ever like title shot as well. This is his first time like kind of on the big stage. This is chance to win a title they both have something really to prove like yeah Pierre Yan is the champion but even then he still has like you know the fans to win over as well because he's getting a little bit of like you know not hate but like you know like he's getting kind of like you know blown over like you know he's not getting paid much attention to as well so both of these fighters they have a lot to um lot to win in this fight so yeah I'm, I'm expecting fireworks man up it's going to be an exciting fight. Oh, yeah, 100%. I'm with you there, Javin, man. I think, right, this fight here, you're going to get... For me, this is going to be the fight that steals, steals the show. Um, obviously, I don't know what order it comes on on Saturday night, but I do believe this is the this is the one fight. I'm, look, I'm looking forward to the whole card, but this is the fight. If you had to say to me right now, which fight would you want to see if it was going to be live right now, I'd say this fight, because it's just got that bit of, you know, that fire, that animosity there. And as you yeah. said, obviously, they've got a lot to prove. Um, watching interviews during the week... You know, Pierre Yan said that he expects Sterling to just run all night and that's not going to happen. And he also called out TJ Dillashaw. He goes that if I do beat Sterling on Saturday night, Saturday night, I want to fight TJ Dillashaw. Dillashaw's obviously, I believe, he's still suspended currently. Does that fight mm. happen for you? And do you think, like, looking at that, that sort of disrespects the rest of the division because it doesn't make sense to bring back Dillashaw from a suspension and give him a world title fight straight away, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. I'm sure he's is he me back from um, suspension? I, I, suspension. I think he's still suspended. It was a, a two-year suspension, wasn't is it? it? Is, yeah, yeah, it was. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm, I thought I saw something where it said um, suspension has been lifted, but all right, that might be wrong. But yeah, I heard about like you know him saying like you know he wants a title fight straight away. I don't think he deserves it. I I've always been kind of old school with it. I think like even like um, Israel Adesanya going straight into like heavyweight and like fighting for a championship. It doesn't sit right with me because I think that's kind of disrespectful for the other fighters as well. I always like kind of believe I know MMA is different too, like boxing and stuff. Mm. Like it's you don't just go into a weight division and get a title fight straight away unless you're Canelo. But <laughs> that kind of doesn't sit right with me. I feel like um, I don't think TJ Dillashaw will get a title fight straight away. I think they will make him like you know fight maybe like one two other fighters before he gets to get that title fight because he. He's not coming from something like, you know, from a break. He's not coming back from a holiday. He's coming back from a suspension. Exactly, from a, yeah. From abusing, so... Exactly, so... There's a, there'll be a lot of, like... So, yeah, um, would... There'll be a lot of, like, octagon rust. You know, I can't call it ring rust because it's not boxing, is it? There'll be a lot of cobwebs yeah. he needs to shake off. And, you know, it's, it's, it's good that you mentioned about, obviously, Israel Adesanya. I mean, I really don't like saying anything bad towards him because... I freaking love the guy. I love his um, attitude that he has. I love the mm. arrogance he's got. But, you, you you know, you look at combat sports, these fighters, as we just mentioned, you know, Vakovic is sat in freezing cold lakes. These fighters, they work their socks off. And, you know, exactly. if he was a fighter in, I don't know, the light heavyweight division right now, you'd be thinking, well, hold on a second. I've potentially been on a good run here. I'm working my socks off. But then you've got another guy coming up that's getting a world title shot straight away. So it doesn't sit right with you. It doesn't sit right with me either. But again, politics of the game, politics yeah. of the sport. And of course, we are right now in a pandemic. I don't think there's any time to waste. Boxing's doing it right now. They're making all these 50-50 fights. They fighters are jumping up divisions to test themselves because we don't know what the future holds for anybody in combat sports. You know, we're hoping that we're moving on from this pandemic. But, you know, as previous in the past, it's shown, you know, it's one step forward with the pandemic and then it's two, three steps backwards. So, yeah, I get where you're coming from. Ideally, you do want to see the fighters that are sort of Build their way up in a certain division, exactly. get a t- title shot next. But again, listen, it's just it's it's politics of the sport. You know, you got to give some credit to Dana White, but then at the same time, you know, you've got a 
you've got to ask the question, why aren't others getting a world title shot? But listen, I agree with you, man. Peter Yad and yeah. uh, as Jermaine Sterling, there's, there's big fights out there to be made in this division. And I'd love to see TJ Dillashaw come back as well and do something, you know. Max Holloway's still around there as well. Jose Aldo's still about, man. Don't ever write yeah. off these old fighters, bro. You know, experience. No. If anyone, if you, if anyone asks you, I'm a huge Jose Aldo mm. fan. Like you know, after he lost to Conor McGregor, I was so so. He, I stopped watching UFC for quite a long time after that loss, man. I, I took it to the heart. I'm like a really old school Jose Aldo fan, man. Because like my background is like Muay Thai and stuff. So like you know, any any of his fights, man, I would watch it. I'll stay up all the time, like five a.m. o'clock in the morning, just to watch it, just because of his leg kicks, man. I, I absolutely love that guy, man. But Seeing him lose actually hurts me, man. That's why I can't watch any of his fights anymore, man. That's how how much of a Jose Aldo <laughs> fan I am. You also ask you any like old school MMA fan, everyone has respect for Jose Aldo, man. Mm. He he was just something else, man. He had this like really raw aggression and just like you know, his his like next level skills, but he's known for being like you know a two three round fighter as well. So quite unfortunate, but still, yeah, you well, can't, can't write these fighters off, man. It's as we said. You know, winner of this fight. I mean, I thought the Jose Aldo Piel Yan one fight was pretty good. I wouldn't mind seeing them do it again. Yeah. You know, the, the, these fighters, you know, your your Jose Aldos, your Conor McGregor's, you know, there's no harm in admitting it. They're not as good as they once used to be, but still yeah. they've got that name. They still have their selling point in the sport, and which is why, you know, you don't rule these fighters out just yet. But this fight on Saturday night. You know, Sterling versus Yan. Like I've said it a few times now, it's definitely the one with yeah. the most heat in it. Um, and he also said, see, again, this see, this is what doesn't sit right with me, right? If I'm a boxer, MMA fighter, yeah. I'm entering the sport to become a world champion. Yeah, you know, the world the holding a world title is a pinnacle in any sort of combat sport or whatever sport it is, right? He said the comment in his, one of his interviews, he goes, he's not he doesn't care about the belt. He just wants to smash Pieta's Jan's face in. So that <laughs> makes me think two things. One, you just, you're that eager to beat him up. Or two, you just want to get in the scrap and you don't really care about the result. Yeah. To be honest, he's, uh, I, I think he's lying. I'll be honest with you. I'll be, I'll be I hope too. so. I hope so. Because yeah, you've got, you got yeah, a lot of people that are going to be paying for that event on Saturday night. Exactly. But even then, it, it, that does actually make it a bit more interesting. And I, I like it when a fighter just does not give a shit and he just wants to go out and have a fight, man. That, that's what makes it more interesting for me. I just I just love it when it's like a wild, crazy fight, man. It's like full gone. But it's not good for the fight, I guess, in the end. Like, you know, you get a lot of injuries and stuff like that. But I don't think he's being honest. Uh, that title does mean a lot. He, he might say it. He might be doing like it for publicity or whatever, or whatever his reason is. But... You can't say as a fighter that like not winning that title doesn't mean a lot. You don't want to. It's just, I think he sees like you know P. Yan as an obstacle for him to get that title, and he's just mm-hmm. put that all of that aggression into like P. Yan himself. Hence why he's saying like you know I just want to like you know break his face. So he's kind of like forgotten about the title, and he's putting all that aggression into that P. Yan because he knows like you know what that fight will mean for him. I personally don't think he rates P. Yan. I really don't think he rates him. I don't think he rates him as a fighter. I think Pierre Yan probably doesn't rate Sterling as a fighter. Um, I think it's fight of the night. And um, this is a tough one to call. It's a real tough one to call yeah. because, you know, you got Yan who's sort of fought on that level in this in the UFC. Sterling, they would say, his biggest wins are against Sadgun and uh, Pedro Munhoz. But I don't know, man. It's just... Again, we, we talked about the step up. You know, Megan Anderson is stepping up on Saturday night. Israel Adesanya is stepping into another man's weight on Saturday night. This is a step up for Aljamain Funkmaster Sterling. He's got a bit of attitude about him, but, you know, you, as you said, you'd like that about fighters, you know? I mean, I think, exactly. you know, when you look at combat sports, I love Conor McGregor's attitude. I think that's what sells for him. But again, sometimes that's what gets him in a lot of trouble. But yeah. I don't know. I see the confidence in him on, on uh, during the press conference and the way that I think... I think this guy wants it more. I don't know. I look at I looked at Yan during fight week, and I was just thinking, seems very calm and relaxed. But the fire is coming from Sterling on Saturday night. Are you going with Sterling? Decision. Uh, or decision. I think. All right. I don't know, man. I'm going to say decision because yeah. I don't think. No disrespect to him, I don't think he's a knockout artist. Two wins by knockout. He's more yeah. of a grappler, sort of submissive type of fighter. But I think if he does beat Yan Saturday night, which I think he will, I think he beats him on points. 
Yeah. Or he either taps him out. Um, I don't I don't see him knocking out Pierre Yan on Saturday night. Yeah. No, it's a prediction. For me, it is gonna be Peter Yan by decision. So I just see like, you know, his pedigree, his background is just gonna play a huge effect, uh, huge part in this fight as well. I just can't see him losing, to be honest. So you're going for um Peter Yan? Peter Yan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Someone's gonna, be gonna be, someone's gonna be eating a lot of humble pie when you wake up on Sunday morning. <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, let's just let's just quickly have a quick mention. We understand Khabib's gonna be there on Saturday yeah. night. He's gonna be in. You the know, court. it's actually a very stacked card. The, it is, yeah. Usually, you got Islam Makachev on the card as well, and then you've got um, Tiago Santos as well fighting on the card. If these two fighters would be worthy of mentioning on the podcast, it's just like mm. you know we don't have the time. Yeah. And then even on the preliminary card, you have Dominic Cruz fighting as well. So it's a Bloody stacked card, man. It's a really good card. Well, this is why we said, is there going to be any card that's going to top this? I mean, I know we're only in March, but this card is already standing out. This card is making a lot of noise. And yeah, um, as I said to you, obviously, we have to quickly talk about the main man, Khabib, right now. He's going to be yeah. there on Saturday. I believe he's in the corner of his brother, right? That's what yeah. I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing. Um, look, honestly, what is going on? Is he coming back? Is, no. is if You don't think he's coming back? He's not coming back. He's done. He's done and dusted, man. Yeah, there's nothing left for him. He knows it. Dana knows it. I know they've got one more secret meeting where, like, you know... They're having dinner on gonna try. tonight. Yeah, 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 yeah. I heard about that, yeah. But what is there left for him, man? I don't, I don't know. I don't think he'll be able to, like, bring him back. Because, like, if you think about it, Dustin Poirier, he's already submitted him. Conor McGregor, he's just had a loss against, like, um, Dustin Poirier. And, like, he's he does not interest people one bit at all because he's even, like, you know, less... You know how he said, obviously, looking back at the, at the division right now, the division that he's world champion in, do you not think, because of how he sort of breezed through everybody, do you not think him stepping up a division makes more sense if he was to come back into sport? It's more of a challenge and it's another world title to win. I personally think if I was, well, if I was Khabib right now, you know, I'd look at the current division I'm in and I'd be like, well, I walk for everybody. I was never yeah. really once tested. I'll go up a division. Because that's personally what I would do. You yeah. know, I mean, if, if I was Dana White right now and I was sat across the table with Khabib, I'd say, listen, forget the Poirier's, forget the McGregor's, you know, they're clearly not getting you out of bed. They're clearly not making yeah. you want to come back into the UFC. I'll tell you what you do, vacate that title, go up a division, become See, a two-way world champion. It's 175 though. This is a huge jump from 155 to 175. That That is a whole level, new level of, sorry, that's a huge level, a huge level of new beasts. Like at one seven five, you got your Kamaru Usman. You size up Kamaru Usman versus Khabib. It's just, it's just too staggering, man. It's too big. I've made a these, division these, at one sixty. These are athletes, though. We're seeing Israel Adesanya do it on Saturday night. It can be mm. done, and I believe, but, I believe the better the sacrifice, and the, I know that, but I believe the better the sacrifice and the more tougher it is. I believe that's what gets Khabib out of bed. I believe potentially that's what gets Khabib back into the UFC. I just look he's a family man he made certain promises but the guy's got so much more to offer there's so many big yeah. fights left out there for him to be made there's a lot of money to be made let's be honest man these fighters yeah. they're only they're, they're going to look at one thing when they do eventually call it there that's how much they've made Khabib can make a lot more now that he's world champion and that he holds, holds all the marbles in this division right now yeah. I mean, how do we not know if he was to come back? You know, we, we, we all, a lot of people said Dustin Poirier, he's not going to beat McGregor in the rematch. And he made it look easy work. He, he walked through Conor McGregor. You know, we've yeah. seen other fighters sort of stepping up right now. There's a lot of talks about Charles Oliveira right now. There's Michael Chandler who's causing a lot of noise in that division. Mm. A second fight with Conor McGregor. Listen, whether he's lost his last few fights or not, the amount of money that generates that fight. You know, and yeah. again, that is a spectacle. Have you seen the amount of noise that first fight made? Nobody missed a second, whether it was the press conference, the way in. You, know, you go on YouTube. Till today, people are still commenting on, <laughs> on Conor McGregor smashing up the, the UFC bus. That's how much <laughs> noise that fight made. So I, I get it. You know, he wants to be challenged. He wants to really look at someone and think, yeah, you are really going to test me to the limit here. Mm. But again, he, Let's, I don't know. Fingers crossed Dana White says something that makes him think, yeah, do you know what? Yeah. He's right. I'll be I need to come back. I can't see anything changing. All right, one of the points you mentioned is money. I don't think... I think Habib's made his money. I mm -hmm. think he's done with the money. He owns his bloody own telecommunication company in bloody Dexter. He, he, he wants that, like, you know, that quiet life now, man. He's, like, trying to build his farm, like, raise one, two young chickens and that. 
But like, he's also like, have you heard of like guerrilla fightwear and stuff? Yeah, I have yeah. Yeah, so he purchased that for like one million dollars as well. So like, he's, I think, in money wise, I think he's all right. Like, yeah, you're right. Like, if he does this fight, like, he can make a huge amount of money. But I don't think he's ever really cared about the money, to be honest. Like, even when um, Thingy, when he, when the McGregor stuff happened after the, uh, at the first fight, when he jumped over the cage and stuff like that, and the McGregor stuff happened, he was like, take my whole purse. He, d- he doesn't mm-hmm. care. That's because he's already, like, made his money as well. And like, even for, like, you know, the Tony Ferguson fight as well, um, Khabib actually offered his full purse to Tony Ferguson just to make that fight happen. Because there was a point where UFC wasn't paying Tony Ferguson enough money, and Khabib was like, "I'll give you my whole purse just to make that fight happen." So I don't know in terms of the money if that will motivate him. I'm not sure. I can't really comment on that. In terms of legacy and stuff like that, definitely, if he was to move up to 175 and fight against like you know one of those top contenders, it would be a huge thing for his legacy. But mm-hmm. I think he's smart like that as well. I think he sees like you know it's just too much of a big jump. 175, lightweight to welterweight. It's it just, is, but never rule anything out in this sport. Never. True. Never true. rule out anything in this sport. Because Mc Mc did it against Nate Diaz, you're right. So exactly. Exactly. You're right. He never ruled nothing out in combat sports. You know, I mean, yeah. myself watching boxing since a very young age, if you would have said to me, Roy Jones Jr. is going to go all the way from middleweight to heavyweight mm. and become world champion, I'd be like, no, man. It can mm. happen. They, it, it, it'll kill him to do it. But again, people fighters like Khabib, man, you again, I, I, as I said earlier on in the podcast, Israel Adesanya, you tell him there's something, you can't do this, you won't be able to do that. He'll be like, okay, cool, you got to do it. That's what I think Khabib's like. I think Khabib, yeah. you know, he need, I totally understand the whole concept of he needs to be challenged to come back because when you beat everybody, in, you, that's not going to motivate you to do it again. Do you know what I mean? What will motivate exactly. you is to beat someone in that division you haven't beat. Or perhaps move okay. up away. Or maybe you beat the guy that's coming up next that's making all the noise. But the bottom line is everybody in that division, no, he's not beaten, except Michael Chandler. Yeah. But I do think he'd absolutely make mix me at Michael Chandler. But that's <laughs> a story for another day. That's all we've got time for on uh, this week's Lights Out MMA podcast, proudly in association of Kamora Sports. The best people out there for the best equipment in combat sports. Uh, Javid, thank you very much for your time. Massive Massive shout out to you, Kamora Sports, for joining us as always. Um, this can never hide the fact that it was you that said we need to do a Lights Out MMA podcast. And I've loved all that we've done. Hopefully, we'll be back yeah. next week for a review of UFC 259. Before I let you go, how excited are you for UFC 259? I'm gassed. Bro, there's not a lot of like, you know, fights I'll stay up for till like three o'clock being a working man and everything, corporate life and stuff. But this one, I'm going to be doing an all-nighter, man. I'm going to be there 5 o'clock in the morning in my room shadow boxing because of how gas the card was, man. <laughs> Watch me. This is going to be a sick card. I'm so I, I take it we'll be going back and forth on WhatsApp like we did on UFC 257. Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> exactly, man. I love it. Love it, man. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. And listen, I just wanted to say, um, I see how the uh, page is building up, man. We'll definitely no, be shouting you. out your stuff, man. Like I said, guys, jump on uh, Kamora Sports for the best hand equipment, best hand wraps, gloves, whatever you need in combat sports. Trust me when I say it, Javid from Kamora Sports has got it. We massively appreciate Kamora Sports working with us closely during this MMA podcast and hopefully plenty more to come in the future. Right, Javid, once again, thank you very much for your time and to our no viewers. Point, to our viewers out there, if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button, like, comment, and of course, follow us and Kamora Sports on all the social media platforms. We'll be sharing the links in our description. Thank you very much, Kamora Sports, once again, and thank you for listening to the Lights Out MMA podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event of the evening. Yeah.